Good morning, and welcome to the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. Here are the stories we're following today. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a series of meetings with his top security aides over the weekend to discuss the next attack on Iran. Now, these meetings came a day after a Hezbollah drone penetrated Israel's defense airspace and exploded next to the private home of Netanyahu north of Tel Aviv. This attack, needless to say, stunned many Israelis. Joining us now is John J. Edwards. He is Bloomberg Weekend, America's managing editor, joining us here in New York. So does this necessarily raise the stakes for some type of retaliation against Iran? I think it, it definitely furthers Israel's resolve to to respond in uh, you know some kind of way that will be seen as uh, firm and um, proportional, but uh, you know sending a sending a message to Iran that it and its proxies, you know, hopefully uh, from uh, Israel's point of view, will see this response and. Uh, decide to go in a different direction. Over the weekend, we also learned that at least the Israeli military is going to take aim at some of the financial arm of Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. What's happening here? Yeah, it's a sort of uh, bank uh, with uh, several branches, uh, you know, sort of throughout uh, Lebanon. And uh, the idea is that the uh, Israelis plan to strike several of these branches, essentially, to uh, sort of disrupt the financial side of uh, Hezbollah's support. Anytime there's been a conversation about Israeli retaliation against Iran, the idea is kind of broken down into two distinct possibilities. One, it's just military installations that would be targeted. Mm -hmm. The other is there there's at least the potential for energy uh, infrastructure to be targeted as well. This is something the Biden administration tried to weigh in, dissuading the Israelis from targeting oil infrastructure. Do we know whether that's going to take hold with uh, Israeli leadership? Yeah, what uh, Netanyahu's office has said this weekend is that it will take into account uh, the advice given by the U.S., but it will make its own decisions. So the the thought is that uh, Israel is... um, they don't want this to spiral out of control. They don't want this to turn into a broad regional war. So, you know, it is likely that uh, any assurances they've uh, given that targets are likely to be military uh, is probably the way it's going to go. Uh, but they want to retain flexibility uh, and not feel like they're, you know, sort of dancing to the U.S.'s tune. John, can we pivot to the U.S. presidential election? Hard to believe there are just two more Sundays to go until Election Day. Where do things stand right now? Well, it is extraordinarily tight. Um, You know, really, uh, polls in the uh, battleground states remain uh, within the margin of error, uh, one direction or another. So it's very hard to say uh, either candidate really has a firm lead at this point. Uh, Polling averages, uh, you know, I saw 538 has... Uh, Trump winning 52 times out of 100 in its, you know, uh, simulations of 10,000 runnings of the election, uh, which is basically the same as, you know, if it were, you know, Kamala Harris winning 52 out of uh, out of 100. So it's really just a a true toss up at this point. And, uh, you know, the candidates are focusing on the uh, battleground states uh, in the late going, uh, obviously taking very different approaches to how they're doing that. So we're speaking Sunday afternoon, U.S. Let's talk about the Harris campaign. Mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. Very much in focus. Also Georgia, too, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, uh, Harris spent some time in Georgia um, uh, targeting uh, black churches. Uh, you know, that's an area that uh, they want to make sure that they try to shore up uh, their support uh, in the black community, which uh, has been uh, somewhat wavering compared with uh, Biden's support in 2020 and even uh, Hillary Clinton's support in 2016. Uh, so that, you know, that's a big focus. And uh, Harris has an interview with Al Sharpton on uh, MSNBC uh, coming up, you know, uh, again, part of that uh, that same effort. What about former President Trump? What has he been up to over the weekend? Uh, he has been uh, mainly in Pennsylvania and uh you know, having uh, he's had a couple of rallies um, at, at which he has made uh, some uh, outrageous statements that uh, were outrageous even for him uh, and and 
you know, pulled a lot of uh, attention away from uh, whatever his, uh, you know, more substantive closing argument uh, might be considered to be. Uh, so, you know, there's, I believe, some frustration, uh, you know, we saw it on the, the uh, Sunday uh, political talk shows today. There was some frustration among uh, Republicans, uh, you know, who are, be, who are being asked about, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, sort of uh, outre uh, comments uh, by by Trump and, you know, not really able to focus on, uh, you know, policy issues uh, that uh, they want to hit. Very doubtful that on the evening of the election, we're going to have a result, a definitive result. And exactly. I would imagine a lot of litigation in the pipeline. Is that not the case? Yes, it, it seems quite likely, uh, you know, both sides are, are marshalling their lawyers. Um, you know, it, we've obviously seen uh, the Trump campaign's tendency to uh you know, challenge results um, broadly, uh, you know, throughout uh, states that uh, they uh, eventually lose. Uh, the Harris campaign as well, uh, you know, is ready to uh, address what they see as any, um, uh, you know, sort of irregularities that emerge. Uh, but uh, yes, it, it should be, uh, again, you know, at least a few days, if not, uh, if not a, a couple of weeks before we have a, a solid result. So when these campaigns are asking for donations, mm -hmm. sometimes we think of political ads as being the primary driver of that funding. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, it may be the cost of litigation. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, certainly the cost of litigation is uh, is going to be a major uh, major factor. But I believe it's it's both. It is still, um, you know, the uh, advertising effort that is is major down the stretch, uh, and as well as the uh, on the ground get out the vote effort. Uh, you know, we had a very uh, good story by our uh, Ted Mann uh, this weekend, focusing on the get out the vote efforts in Pennsylvania. And uh, the Democrats do have a much more, uh, you know, robust uh, operation on the ground in most states, uh, whereas uh, the Republicans are uh, mainly outsourcing their on-the-ground efforts to uh, political action committees, uh, you know, like uh, Elon Musk's and others. John, we'll leave it there. Thanks for making the time to chat with us. John J. Edwards, Weekend America's Managing Editor for Bloomberg News. Joining us now is Thomas Hayes. He is the chairman at Great Hill Capital, joining us uh, from here in New York City. Tom, thanks for making time to chat with us. You and I were talking a little while ago about the fact that there seems to be powerful momentum right now happening for the U.S. equity market. I think the S&P 500 closed Friday at yet another record. We have seen six straight weeks of gains. Is this a little concerning to you? A little bit, particularly because of the seasonality, Doug. So this is the seventh time in the last decade the S&P has been up six weeks in a row. And it's basically a coin flip based on history, whether we get a, a seventh up week this week, about 50-50. So we'll see what happens. But I think what you're seeing here, Doug, is a combination of complacency plus liquidity. Uh, most central bank cuts in the month of September that we've seen since 2020 and prior to that 2009. And then you couple that with, if you look at betting odds, if, if you place any weight on betting odds, potentially uh, the market may be pricing in a, a shift to slightly more pro-business policy, whether premature or not, it seems to be telling the story, particularly when the market's going up and our earnings came in a little bit lighter than expected so far. So stocks are up. Yields are down by and large, and we had Rafael Bostic saying at the end of last week he's not in a rush to lower interest rates. Do you think the Fed may be a little concerned here? Put aside for the moment the labor market, put aside for a moment this decline that we have seen in the rate of inflation. Is the Fed perhaps a little concerned about easy financial conditions? Well, it, you know, they have shifted to a dual sided risk and the labor market, uh, as uh, low as the unemployment rate is, it is showing some signs of weakness. Now, are we guaranteed getting six consecutive cuts in a row? The market's been a little bit too optimistic. So I'm not sure if November is a foregone conclusion. I think the market's pricing in 225. Uh, basis point cuts, but maybe we only get one. I think that's perfectly fine given the current conditions. Um, you know, the other thing that I've really had my eye on, Doug, 
is last month we got a record move out of bonds, a two standard deviation move out of bonds. And you got to look back all the way to 2001 to 2003 to see that level of move. And, and uh, if you remember, and I think you've been, you were around uh, back then, Doug, uh, <laughs> it, you, you had uh, a, a, an unprecedented rally following that in small caps versus large caps, in value versus growth, and in emerging markets versus developed markets. Three trades that very few people are uh, confidently positioned for right now. I want to change gears, talk a little bit about the other side of the world, the Asia Pacific. In the week ahead, markets in Asia are gearing up for what is likely to be the busiest week of new listings in more than two years. Particularly, it's China, it's India, it's Japan. What does it say to you that uh, developing markets um, are in the process of raising a lot more capital? Yeah, the game is back on. Animal spirits are coming in. The Chinese government has flipped on the dime. Uh, yes, uh, investors want more. Yes, investors are skeptical after a two-year beatdown. And yes, they are going to get more because why? Because you can't be half pregnant. They've already turned the corner. They're going full bore. They will do more, and then they will do more, and then they will do more. And the Chinese government, the game is back on. We're going to see more fiscal stimulus uh, coupled with the monetary stimulus, coupled with backstopping the property market. And when that happens, massive flows. And I think, uh, and you mentioned Japan there, you know, some of these emerging markets that have been the beneficiary of emerging market flows out of China, like Japan, like India, that have gotten a little bit heated, I think we're going to see a little bit of weakness in those markets as money slowly and uh, more confidently over time moves back into China, particularly the most high quality companies in China. Uh, and uh, and uh, the IPO market tell the slate that you mentioned tells you everything you need to know about uh, confidence uh, re recovering and starting to rebuild. So are you a buyer of risk assets in China right now? Yes. Uh, our One of our largest positions is Alibaba. This has been uh, like watching paint dry. It's been dead money for us for a year. Uh, we spent every red day buying more stock. People looked at us like we had three heads. <laughs> but here's the fact, Doug. You can buy Alibaba today for the same price it was 10 years ago. The only difference is the revenues are up 1,300% and the earnings and cash flow are up 650%. So what else do you want to talk about? I mean, we see it as one of the greatest price is what you pay, value is what you get. And in terms of the cash generated, they generate 20 to $25 billion a year in cash. They got $80 billion of cash on the balance sheet. They've got a, a piece of basically every AI startup in China. They give them credits for compute power in their cloud business in exchange for equity. I mean, if you wanted to play an AI ETF in China, it's called Alibaba, and that's got, got zero credit in the price right now. Uh, couple that with AI, with the cloud, and with the consumer coming back with the fiscal stimulus, it's the toll, it's the toll gate for China. So uh, we like that position and we love the valuation at high single digits down from historic multiples of 20, 25 times, and they'll come back over time. Let's talk about the U.S. presidential election. We're a little more than two weeks away from November 5th. Obviously, it's a critical day or will be. Uh, how are you feeling about the election and what would uh, Trump presidency mean versus uh, Harris presidency for the business environment in the U.S.? Yeah, it seems like the market is starting to price in slightly more pro-business policy, which implies a Trump win. That's evidenced in the data in the uh, in some of the polling data and certainly in some of the betting data in some of the betting pools uh, that you look at is starting to favor a Trump win. I think betting on the basis of who's elected is a fool's errand. If you recall, um, when Trump got elected, everyone said China stocks were going to do horribly. From 2016 to 2018, China stocks did better than they've done in years. Uh, and then when Biden was in, they thought China was going to do great. It did horribly, the worst it's done in a decade. Uh, furthermore, everyone said when Trump would get elected, energy stocks would go to the moon. Uh, the exact opposite happened. When you have more drilling, the price goes down and the stocks went down with it. A lot of supply uh, was not good for energy stocks under Trump. 
So I think that what the, the ideal outcome from a stock market standpoint, Doug, is just a split government. So whether uh, Trump is elected or Harris is elected in the executive branch, so long as you have a different party in either the House or the Senate, the market loves gridlock. And empirically, the market does best with a split government. So that's that's what I think we want to be focused on as market participants in the next few weeks. Okay, so if you're reading the data properly, or at least these indicators that you're looking at right now, and there is a higher probability of a Trump administration, do you really believe that additional tariffs are pro-business? Well, look, I, I've seen some studies on uh, the impact if Trump actually put forth the 60 percent tariffs on China uh, the data that I've looked at uh, implies that that would only reduce Chinese GDP by 1%. So uh, we would potentially, uh, in the short term, bear the brunt of the higher prices. However, uh, as some of his selected potential Treasury secretaries and trade negotiators in his uh, formative administration have implied, that is the ask it is open to negotiation. And Trump has said as much, we just want to do a deal. So he'll hit them hard, bring them back to the table and try to get a pragmatic outcome. As we saw in the early part of the administration from prior to COVID, uh, that he did have some success in doing that. And the subsequent administration actually followed through and kept the tariffs he put in place uh, active during the, uh, during the Biden administration. So I think it's more of a Let's get to the table, but uh, first I'm going to bop you, and then I'm going to, you know, <laughs> hand you an ice pack to help uh, uh, heal together and make something that works for both parties. Uh, and, I, and I think we'll see a pragmatic uh, move after the initial shock factor. All right, we'll leave it there, Tom. Thank you so much. Thomas Hayes is chairman at Great Hill Capital, joining us here on the Daybreak Asia podcast. Joining us now is George Cipollone. He is Portfolio Manager at Penn Mutual Asset Management, joining us uh, from outside Philadelphia. George, thanks for making time. We can start with either the Fed or a lot of the earnings that the market's beginning to digest. What do you think is the more important driver right now? Yeah, hey, it's great to talk to you again, Doug. I think so. So, so breaking it up in that context is perfect because the Fed has been very important. Uh, I think Truck and Miller likes to state that the most important factor for the markets is liquidity. And one of the things we've seen more recently is, you know, the market has, you know, usually entering October, we get a really volatile period. And we did a little earlier in August. And then the market's actually been up the last six weeks. So it's been pretty surprising in terms of the run up here recently during a traditionally volatile period, especially in an election year, especially with a potential war in the Middle East and port strikes and all this kind of stuff going on. So, you know, the one thing we've noticed in the numbers is that liquidity is coming into the market globally, not just in the U.S., but in the U.S. too, with the Fed with the Fed uh, rate cut um, just about a month ago. And so that's the one part of the equation. There is more liquidity. So that is important. I think it is a factor. The second part now, and we see that. So so from a bottom-up standpoint, even though I like to talk top-down, I am a bottom-up investor. And so now earnings is the critical element here. And so what we're seeing is, for example, the market broadening out, which is very good. Um, we've seen technology actually take a little bit of a hit relative to everything else. So what that means for us, because earnings have not followed through yet, is that PEs are up, valuations are up. So now this earnings period is important because, as they all are, but this one is important because now we want to see earnings follow through and support these valuations. And that's where we're at today. Are you taking a closer look these days at smaller cap stocks since they're more closely tied to kind of cycles in the economy? Uh, we we are. And so we're all cap investors with our mutual fund. And one of the benefits of that is that now, now there's a challenge, obviously, right? When the S and P has done as well as it's done for so long, it's kind of tough to keep up. But just in the past few months, we saw the market broaden out, and that you know we we just breathed a huge sigh of relief because we did finally see small caps catch up, and we did finally see value stocks catch up to growth, which was great. But yes, we do, Doug, and and mainly because so traditionally. You don't use this market's a little strange. You know, basically the largest of the large companies are growing the fastest, which 
tends to happen sometimes, but that's hard to maintain. Again, there's just the law of big numbers at some point that will kick in. Where in small caps, traditionally, if you can find a 100 or a 200 or a $500 million market cap company that can grow, you can maybe have a runway of growth for maybe five or 10 years. And, and that's, that, that, that is an area that we do like to play in. So the economy seems to be holding up reasonably well. You were talking a moment ago about ample levels of liquidity, and I'm wondering whether that's a little concerning for the Fed, that financial conditions are so easy. I think one of the things the Fed really is has to be surprised about, because I know I sure was, and I think most of the market was, is the fact that if you look across the yield curve from twos to thirties, even, uh, we've seen a rise of about 35 to 40 basis points across the curve in an environment where the Fed was ready to cut. They were so ready to cut, they cut by 50 basis points. They made a pretty large statement there. And so to see the yield curve act in this way, there, there are a few reasons why. To your point, the economy has been stronger than anybody would have anticipated. The job market has been has remained strong. The economy has remained resilient. And if you look at so, so, so Doug, I think the biggest thing right now is going to be what happens with inflation. And we have that example of the 70s and the resurgence of inflation that came back after we really thought it was beat. And at this point, I think we really felt like inflation was beat. And there's so many metrics that are showing that it's beat. But if we do get a little tick back up, that's going to cause some problems now for the Fed, given the fact that they just cut by 50. And so we've seen that in rate cut expectations, which have come way down. George, can we talk about the election a little bit and what it may mean for markets in your view? Sure. How do you handicap yeah. the situation? So so it's... It, it is important. And, and so it's funny. I think one of the biggest takeaways I can have just from reading history and you know trying to think long term is to really just focus on the long term. I think Munger said it best when he just said politics really can mess with you know your minds and your decisions and your behavior and, and in terms of making investment decisions. So I don't want to get too caught up in that. But to your point, there are some clearly important issues that are gonna that we're gonna face. And there's some clearly divergent paths that that each each um, candidate and each party wants to take us on. And so if you look at Trump, he wants to cut taxes and he wants to grow our way out of this debt problem that we have. And, and the interesting thing is that neither party talks too much about that because it is so much of a concern, mm. at least it is of mine. But again, his, so his path is going to be, hey, look, let's cut taxes and let's grow our way out of it. That's certainly one way to do it. Uh, it could, again, you know, you think thinking back to that inflation point I brought up, it could be inflationary depending on what he wants to do or how he implements it. And then if you think about what Harris wants to do, you know, maybe raise corporate taxes, which, you know, could be a you know, some people have said maybe a 5% hit to EPS. I don't think the markets in general would like that. So again, two very clearly divergent paths and important, um, you know, Im importantly different paths at this point. And so, yeah, it's something we're cognizant of. I don't want to put too much weight into either one, but I definitely want to know, again, what their policy is and what it can mean for stocks. It's interesting that you mentioned U.S. debt levels. I was struck mm -hmm. by the fact that interest cost now on U.S. debt, climbed in the last fiscal year to the highest level since the 1990s. I think the Treasury spent something around $882 billion on net interest payments in the fiscal year through September. Does the bond market seem to be concerned by this, to, in your view? Yeah, I think, I think, Doug, one of the clearest things that we can see, and this is, you know, so you have some people that are, you know, clearly troubled by the debt levels. Me, just as a citizen, you know, us as citizens, I do think it is important. We should be concerned about it for our children and grandchildren, obviously. Um, but one of the clear ways where we're seeing at least some sort of change, I think, is in where is the flight to quality. So historically, the flight to quality would be to U.S. Treasuries. And we're not seeing that right now. Over the past year, if you think about it, you know, bonds are still in this you know, major drawdown. Bonds in general, treasury bonds have had a pretty big drawdown over the last few years. And that still holds true, even though there's been some swings. But look at gold. Gold's gone from 2000 to 2700, up 35%. Silver up from 23 to 34, up 48%. Even Bitcoin, which people are saying are digital gold, up from forty six thousand to sixty nine thousand, up sixty four percent. So I do think that is, you know, so from a, you know, look, I, I invest in companies, but I, I do want to know this, um, and I do want to be aware of this because I do think it's important. You know, has do we have a new flight to quality? And I think that's a question that we should ask now, given the levels of debt that we have. 
I'm curious as to how you're evaluating opportunities offshore, particularly China, with this bazooka of economic stimulus, whether it's on the monetary side, whether it's on the fiscal side. There's no doubt that Beijing is intent on solving this problem of not only weak growth, but this deflationary trap that China has been in. I mean, how are you evaluating opportunities in Asia? So, so one of the things I'll mention is that if you look at a ratio of international stocks to U.S. stocks, or I, was, I should say U.S. to international stocks, it's as high as it's ever been. The U.S. has been absolutely dominant across the globe as a market. And one of the major reasons why, obviously, we have the largest of tech companies and AI is a big global phenomenon. And, and we have benefited more than, than just about anybody else. So to your point, when I look at my screens and I'm looking for cheap stocks, which is what I do first, Obviously, international stocks show up a lot, and Chinese stocks do show up a lot. Now, we tend not to invest in a lot of Chinese stocks, quite frankly, because I'm not sure if we could. And and this has been a common, you know, a common argument against Chinese stocks. I'm not sure if we could actually trust the accounting or the numbers or the government. But they've done a great job over a long period of time growing. And now that consumer is weak. You know, they 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 have so much debt, whether it's in their real estate markets. Look, the US does too. But if you look at the real estate market and now their consumer behavior. So here's one interesting, really interesting thing, Doug. If you listen to company earnings reports, whether it's, you know, and, and the clearest one are European luxury companies, they feasted on a growing consumer base out of China. And that's completely changed. Consumer behavior in China feels so different today than it did just a year or two ago. And that's been a big concern. So, right. So China is throwing a ton of money into it. And we saw all those stocks really spike in a short period of time. And quite frankly, I'm not sure if we can trust that move yet, or I'm not sure if the consumer behavior will change as much as China wants it to change. Now, the liquidity factor changed and that went up and we do see that. So you can just maybe bank on that. But I think at the end of the day, look, we have to find good companies that can grow sustainably well in all environments, or at least from where they are here. And that's just a really tricky one to to tell at this point. George, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to have a chance to chat. George Cipollone, Portfolio Manager at Penn Mutual Asset Management. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, your morning brief on the stories making news from Hong Kong to Singapore and Wall Street. Look for us on your podcast feed every day on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcast. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Doug Krisner. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia.